It's very nice to be here. Um, I'm absolutely honored to be here today. I was fortunate enough to be at Config in person in 2020 before lockdown. And I had a fantastic time. I got to meet lots of great people in the design community, hear some great talks, hang out with my team, some of which are here today. And um, yeah, I'm just so excited to be here um, sharing some of my story with you. So, like a pull request, this talk is sharing ideas, solutions. You may or may not want to merge everything into your own design process or culture, and that's fine. Um, what's right for GitHub may not be right for you. However, I hope to give you some ideas to consider, and perhaps you'll uh, cherry pick some of those ideas and adopt them in your own team. This is a talk about the world of open source software and how software development has influenced the way that I work, how it's influenced the culture of design at GitHub, and through this experience and also working on design systems has influenced the way that I lead. So I guess I want to start by sharing, like, it's not really that surprising that software engineering as a discipline has influenced design. After all, that's where it started. Human-computer interaction um, was born of computer science. The photo on my slide is um, from Xerox Park and shows a computer screen with what is thought to be one of the earliest, first, uh, uh, earliest graphical user interfaces. However, like me, you may have experienced more separation between the stages of design and implementation, depending on where you have worked. And perhaps there are now big divides between design and engineering. Design has become a distinct profession, often reflected in organizational structures, and, ha and have, you, know, you see engineering and design under different separate leaders. So I wanted to talk a bit about where I started in design. My first real job was as an assistant in a graphic design and print uh, studio in the UK. I had not realized that graphic design or web design was a job that I could pursue. I had enjoyed creative pursuits um, since I was young and loved painting and drawing, but had been advised that I couldn't do art as a job. <laughs> I had also begun getting more interested in computers in my late teens, um, mostly through playing games like StarCraft and Action Quake uh, at LAN parties. Uh, if you're too young to know what a LAN party is, you can Google that later. Might be showing my age there. Um, so for some reason, I, I felt that I needed to choose between the technical and the creative, um, that I couldn't do both. So it was quite a surprise to me to find myself working somewhere that made it seem like art could be a job, or at least there was careers that required creative and a technical element. So while I was working in the print industry, the industry was pretty worried that web was taking their business. And they were starting to build out um, web design services in the place that I worked. I learned Front Page and Dreamweaver, and my mentor at the Print Center showed me how to update the company website. And that's when I knew what I really wanted to do. And from there on, I pursued jobs um, that let me grow, grow my career as a web designer. A few years later, I decided to go backpacking to Australia. This is something that uh, at least a lot of British people tend to do. Um, this uh, is a photo of me taken in Kojanup, Western Australia, where I worked for a few months in a bar. It was a really interesting and amazing experience. And it was also in that era where you wear those kind of like tooth-shaped necklaces as well. I don't know if anyone was into that. 
So after a while, I started to get a little low on the cash, and um, I made my way to Sydney to get like a real job and look for office work. After a few months contracting, I was really fortunate to land a job in a local government organization. Um, they liked that I knew how to do graphic design and web design and offered me a job and a sponsorship, and I got a work visa. While I was working at, um, in government, one of the biggest projects I worked on was to do a rebuild and redesign of their website. Uh, we worked with a vendor who provided CMS and web design services. And through this agency, I started to connect with more of the tech community. I started to go to local events and made friends with some people that hosted co-working sessions. Um, it was called Jelly, and I have absolutely no idea why still, but this is a photo from one of those co-working sessions at a friend's house. Getting to be part of the web community made a huge difference to me. It made a huge difference to my growth and career path. I learned about different technologies and approaches to design and development. Um, which led me to increasingly hacking on side projects and bringing these ideas sometimes back to my work. And then I started to get asked to speak at events too, uh, mostly to talk about working in web and in the government. I remember the first time I did an all expenses paid trip to Canberra. I was sitting in the hotel restaurant and they, uh, someone came over and asked me if I wanted the lobster. And I was like, this is it, I have made it. <laughs> I noticed when I was at um, these government events that a lot of people would come and uh, approach me and ask me questions about how we were working on things like web standards and asking for my advice. I realized that the local government web development community didn't really have um, the same type of community that I had uh, in Sydney. I realized I was in a position to help create that community largely because I was like the web person at a state government organization. And so I did. Uh, together with a colleague, we started a community newsletter, ran events, created a magazine for web developers in local government. We also really tried to get people onto Twitter during these events. We were very excited about government on Twitter. We'll reflect on that later. Um, <laughs> Many of the people who came to the first event from across New South Wales shared that it was the very first time that they had ever met another web developer in government, and they were just so excited. And it was just, that was when I knew I'd done a good thing and helped bring that community um, to this, this like more niche area. Being part of the community helped expand my horizons, helped me learn and make new connections, and eventually, for me, this led to new job opportunities. So my journey with GitHub began in July 2010, after I had left government and was working in a small boutique design agency. Um, this was in Sydney. A handful of us had decided to participate in a hackathon competition. As we began jamming on ideas for the hackathon entry, the engineers turned to me and said I should get on GitHub, because that's where they were collaborating on code. And this is actually a photo from that hackathon where I actually signed up. Something about using Git and GitHub sparked my curiosity. And so I found more, more and more excuse, excuses to practice and build the basic commands I had learned. I moved my website from WordPress to Jekyll, uh, using GitHub pages to publish it. Something also felt better to me about using Jekyll as opposed to, to WordPress. I felt closer to the code um, that powered my website. I felt more in control, and it started to help me understand a little bit more about how websites are built. My interest in the tech and startup scene continued to grow. I ended up taking a trip to the States and participating in a hackathon competition in early 2011 called the Startup Bus, because it was a hackathon on a bus designed to create new startups. Um, that is actually the bus that I was on in that photo. It traveled from San Francisco to Austin um, for South by Southwest. 
uh, I was invited to join a team who seemed to be excited that I knew how to use Git and GitHub. The team was fairly successful. Uh, although we didn't win, we got into the finals and got some media attention. The sponsors of the event noticed me. They were looking for a designer. After some interviews, they offered me a job, and three months later, I packed up my things and moved to San Francisco. I wouldn't credit my whole success in, in getting this job entirely to having learned to use GitHub, but it did open a door that might otherwise have been closed. So my interest in front end kept growing. I kept learning more about style guides and CSS frameworks and open source. I remember reading Nicole Sullivan's article called The Media Object Saves Hundreds of Lines of Code. This uh, pinkish blobby image on there is um, from that article demonstrating how a few lines of code could be reused in hundreds of use cases. I soon discovered her object-oriented CSS wiki on GitHub too which I, I'm sure I've referenced hundreds of times since. I checked out Bootstrap 2, which was also open sourced in 2011 on GitHub. I read Nicholas Gallagher's article about HTML semantics and front-end architecture, which I think um, at the time I made everyone on the team uh, read if they had not yet. Um, he also shipped a CSS framework called Suit CSS, um, which was also open sourced on GitHub. These ideas influenced other developers to create open source CSS frameworks um, centered around CSS utilities. Uh, there's Tachyons by Adam Morse and Base CSS by Brent Jackson, which, full disclosure, is my, uh, is now, he's now my husband set in the audience just here. <laughs> um, yeah, so we used to be really fun at parties, just talked about design systems and CSS the whole time, but yeah. <laughs> So being able to check out um, the source of these projects was incredibly useful as I got deeper into design systems. And it helped me grow a greater, greater pre appreciation for open source as well. I loved helping other people, usually other designers, learn to code and use Git and GitHub. I felt empowered by the ability to uh, collaborate in the same place as engineers. And even though I had just like some basic front end skills, it was still empowering to be able to design and build a website and ship it myself. I wanted this for other people too. So I worked at Etsy for a couple of years before GitHub. Uh, this is a photo of us doing a Jelly co-working session, which I brought to Etsy uh, from my previous days in Sydney as a way of creating a collaborative cross uh, design team co-working session. I still didn't know what it, why it was called Jelly, but I got everyone onto it somehow. While I was at Etsy, I was part of a, a team that um, did a redesign of their seller tools, and with it, a new design system. I started trying to um, improve the onboarding process for designers while I was there, and taught people how to set up their dev environment and use this new design system. The one thing that almost every designer got as I was teaching them the dev environment, how to deploy, set up their sandbox, all those things, the one thing that they got was that they could, they really just got, oh, I can like design and build prototypes now with this design system. It was like they were released from having to know every detail of CSS. They didn't have to start from scratch. They could grab a few components, style some things with utilities, and quickly they had a design mocked up in code using the same design system used in production. It was like they had gotten over a barrier, and now the world of development was theirs for the taking. And this is why I think design systems can be an enabler for designers learning to code. And then GitHub reached out to me about a job. I was pretty excited by the opportunity to work on a product that I used on almost a daily basis, and that had led to opening doors for me in my own career. I'd also seen that Primer, GitHub's design system, had been open sourced a few months earlier by Mark Otto. He was also one of the creators of Bootstrap. 
Since I had learned so much from open source frameworks and had been working on Etsy's design system, I really valued that a company was making their own design system public, not just the docs, but all the source code as well. So in December 2015, I joined GitHub. I should, should have said that that was actually broccolini in my mouth in that photo, because <laughs> that's my username. So um, one of the first things that people comment on after joining GitHub is how much GitHub uses GitHub for almost everything. Regardless of the role you have or the team that you're on, um, you'll be using GitHub on pretty much a daily basis. This often leads to discovering um, features that you might not have been aware of um, previously, which is a great thing. We use things like, we use repos as like kind of home pages for each of our teams um, so that we can share like team specific documentation, where to find us on Slack. Um, in the design org, we have our central design org repo and then sub team repos for, thing, for teams like customer research and product design. And then we have a repo for design managers and another one for directors to, to run rhythm of the business updates. We use um, projects and issues to track our work. So we use GitHub to run our org in a way. Each, um, each team within design has its own repo. And so I've gotten really used to this. And I expect this from every team at GitHub. But if you're new to GitHub and you haven't experienced this elsewhere, it can, it can take a bit of getting used to and, and be, feel a little bit overwhelming at first. Many designers explore GitHub features as an excuse to get more familiar with the product. And often, this evolves into finding ways to make tasks and operations more efficient and repeatable. We've even dubbed our um, design director, um, Manuel, the automator, because if there is a way that he can write an action or workflow for something, he does. And of course, we also have a automated uh, org chart as well, which is open source and also available in the Figma community that Manuel made, because that needs to be automated. Uh, you can create, you, we have a Figma plugin that lets you create the org chart from YAML or a JSON file. So maybe check it out. But the reason why I think this is, is a great thing that we're using this every day is that it, help, it, it keeps building on the fact that GitHub, at GitHub, our colleagues are also our customers. Um, we're not the only company where this is true. Um, Figma, Figma, of course, has this as well. But I think it's worth mentioning because it definitely has an influence on the way that we work and on our culture as well. In the lead up to new ships, we use a feature flag system to make work in prog progress features available to staff. This means we can enlist our colleagues in testing, catching bugs, or discovering opportunities to improve the experience before we ship it to customers. Because many staff are representative of our customers, it also means we're, we often feel the pain points too. And then if we find an opportunity to improve something for us, the chances are that it will improve things for other customers as well. Chris Wonstroff, one of the founders of GitHub and former CEO, recently tweeted a great example of how being your own target audience can be a great way to design a product. He shared that the new repo screen was a total accident. He said he threw a few com repetitive commands together to help him quickly create new repos. After a few weeks, he thought others might find that useful too, and added those same commands to the new repo screen. And it's proven so useful, it hasn't changed all that much 16 years later. While the repo flow may not have changed um, all that much, our platform features and the diversity of our customers have. We not only host some of the biggest open source projects critical to the software development ecosystem, but also Fortune 500 companies build software on GitHub too. And the GitHub platform has expanded as well. GitHub now provides advanced security features, CLI and project management tooling, which we hope improves um, productivity and increases developer happiness. 
And we're transforming the way that we build software by infusing uh, the platform with AI, like our little buddy Copilot. As our <laughs> it's the little animations, I love these. Um, as our platform has grown, so is the diversity of our customers. And we have to balance our own assumptions with research and seeking feedback from those customers. Just last week, we held a customer panel on inclusive design with people who have disabilities and lived experiences using assistive technologies. We were fortunate to have an incredibly diverse group um, with people who used GitHub regularly. Um, and some of them were working on building their own assistive technologies or doing things like academic research. As GitHub continues to, on its mission to become the home for all developers, this is a fantastic reminder that we need to engage with diverse customers and, more importantly, continue to hire and build a diverse team. Ed Summers, our head of accessibility, who is also blind, frames this well. He says, nothing for us without us. As a design team, we have the opportunity to make a significant impact on making GitHub an inclusive experience. One of the ways that we have and can continue to do this is delivering and deliver on this goal is through our design system, Primer. So I'll talk about Primer for a bit. It's not a surprise to me that Primer largely grew out of the design team. Early on, pretty much all designers could code at GitHub. And it was pretty, I think, I believe it was a requirement as well when I joined in 2015. And many designers that are working on technical parts of the product are required to have some basic skills as well. So designers were often taking a lot of responsibility for the implementation of designs. And so they felt the pain points of scaling CSS firsthand. In a way, it's also empowering um, that designers could sometimes fix uh, these paper cuts in our user experience themselves. Many designers collaborate in issues, use discussions to discuss design solutions, use pull requests to explore solutions. Many designers still push up their own PRs um, with UI changes, and some even also deploy. There's even designers running office hours to teach each other development techniques, such as Dylan and Michael, who run a regular training session called Designers Develop. On design systems, we would often use pull requests to propose ideas like sharing a work in progress, just like a design mock. Like in this example on the screen, I was developing a proposal for new typography utilities. There was a vibrant discussion with 28 comments before the pull request was merged in. We also use design tools like Figma, too. I think one of the reasons moving to Figma felt like a natural change is because it made it really easy to collaborate, share a URL, and design in the open. And that felt kind of similar to, how, to our workflow at GitHub. Designers that are strong developers also use Figma. They know when to use Figma versus code. Just like a designer knows when to move from sketching flows or wireframes to going deeper into visual design. I particularly like Rune Madsen's framing. He says he explores code and design as a material. I think designers who are fluent in code use code just like other mediums. A designer who can code has an additional skill in their toolbox to find the right solution to a design problem. It's designing with code, not taking away time from design. While engineers and designers may need to focus on different parts of a problem, putting people in buckets with no flexibility to blur the lines can mean you miss out on someone's full potential. Design systems, regardless of company, uh, seems to be an area that attracts and benefits from designer-developer hybrids. Having an interest in design systems, naturally I started poking around at the CSS in Primer when I joined GitHub. I found that there were other designers passionate about making improvements, and we quickly had a small, group, uh, small working group that I collaborated with regularly. Um, pictured on the screen is a, a rare in-person meetup where we were brainstorming ideas. 
About six months after this group formed, I began working on Primer full-time as a design systems lead, along with my colleague, John Rohan. Working on Primer at GitHub enabled me to gain a much deeper knowledge of the, pro of the product. On the screen is a GIF from early 2017 when I was working on our color system and discovered we had around 2,500 hex values floating around in our code base. That wasn't ideal for trying to make updates to color and be consistent, right? And this is before color modes and Figma as well, you know, this is like back in the day. <laughs> So just by working on uh, color alone, I got to explore a huge amount of the product because I had to find, I had to figure out a system that would work in our UI and also test it. So Primer has been open sourced on GitHub uh, since 2015. Uh, I mentioned it was just before I joined GitHub. It's grown from a CSS framework to an ecosystem of multiple libraries, including our icon library, Octacons, React and Rails, components, design tokens, Figma components. We don't really seek a lot of contributions like um, an open source framework might, but it's, it's really designed for GitHub's needs versus for everyone. But making it available in the open is a way of us sharing how we approach design systems. And as we increasingly make Primer accessible, I hope it will serve as an even more useful resource to, to others building design systems. So I led the Primer team for about six years uh, before stepping into my current role. I grew with the team from lead to manager to director. The team grew in size in area of responsibility, taking on things like platform design work to work on cross-cutting features like our navigation, a new version of which is recently shipped, and specialist areas like accessibility design. In 2020, we shipped a visual refresh across github.com, including new octacons, alongside a redesign of the repo homepage, which hadn't changed much for the previous five years. On screen is a GIF uh, of the repo homepage design from 2008 to 2020 when we shipped this update. A little trip down memory lane. Later in 2020, during GitHub Universe, our yearly conference, we shipped dark mode. This was one of GitHub's most highly requested features. The ship was a pretty epic undertaking, if I'm allowed to say that. We wanted to keep it under wraps so that we could have a, a one more thing kind of big reveal. And so we had to rely heavily on our staff giving us feedback alongside researching uh, what customers had designed. Uh, there's like a lot of customer design themes out there. So that helped us understand a little bit more about what customers wanted. And from that research we knew, and from internal feedback, we knew that one dark theme would not work for all. And we quickly followed this up with dimmed and high contrast mode to meet people's uh, preferences and accessibility needs. Shipping site-wide changes like this taught me a lot about how to deliver updates in a customer-first way. Making sure that customers had opportunities to opt in and give feedback to bigger changes before they were made generally available. It also helped me to understand how to prioritize changes that bring the product forward and be OK with not every single part needing to change at once. As someone that is told or admits to sometimes that they're a little bit perfectionistic, these experiences taught me to embrace progress over perfection. This is particularly important when working on a product that is old enough to accumulate a bit of tech and UX debt that customers have grown familiarity with over a long period of time. Continuing to aim for a perfect solution will often be futile. Shipping smaller increments lets you learn and invest that feedback, which is likely to help you get to a better result overall. I think being perfectionistic can go hand in hand with wanting to control too. Something that our brand has taught me is that our customers and our colleagues feel a strong sense of ownership over our brand. 
We can provide logo guidelines, when or when not to use the Octocat, which is, by the way, the full name is Mona Lisa Octocat, a nickname Mona. So we can provide these guidelines, but inevitably, people will want to use, the, use Mona on all sorts of things, from team swag, um, tech events, to making Octocats of themselves, or even tattooing it on them. Even I illustrated an Octocat before I joined GitHub because I loved it so much. I embrace that we will not have full control over elements like this, and that it's a pretty awesome thing if people want to create moners of themselves um, and create ca see themselves in the character. Having a character that has inspired so much creativity has, and has become so embedded as part of our culture was not lost on me when I moved into leading design. I needed to make sure that the design org would build trust in me no matter what team they were on, not just design systems. I knew I wanted to make some changes, but I was also really mindful that there were things I needed to preserve, particularly with our culture and the incredible creativity inspired by Mona. I knew my own experiences as a designer, my career path, and leading design systems would influence how I lead. Just before I learned I was uh, stepping into head of design, I listened to a design details podcast with Hallie, the founder and CEO of, Reno of Wayno. He said, every company starts to look like their dog. He said more than that, but that's the bit that stuck in my head and is easy to repeat. What he, what he really talked about was um, how all your faults and hopefully your positives are magnified as a leader. And that's why every company starts to look like their dog. So while I'm not running a company, I think the same can be true when you're also a leader of a large org. I know I can draw on my strengths and experiences with design systems, that, I can, that there's a lot I can apply through lessons in shipping large-scale updates to customers. I've grown a strong familiarity with a large amount of the product, either through component and style updates or using features as part of my work. I also knew I had to be mindful of my perfectionistic tendencies, and I needed to give people space to learn and make mistakes, and ensure I repeated my belief in progress over perfection, and actually put that into practice. I have many more faults too, but forgive me if I don't want to share them all on stage in front of thousands of people. So it's important, though, to, for me to make sure that I make it safe for people to call me out when I mess up. I believe in building trust and enabling uh, your team to have candid conversations with you. Building a healthy and productive culture where your team, in th team is really thriving takes work. I was thinking about this when I happened to listen to another podcast. I'm a podcast person, sorry, folks. Um, I was listening to a podcast called Acquired, uh, where they interviewed Tobias, the CEO of uh, Shopify. He talked for a while about being intentional with building your company's culture, and that things like Google's 20% time is an expression of their culture. Simply adopting 20% time in your own company would not mean that you replicated Google's culture. It particularly resonated with me. I think, uh, I think of building culture a bit like building a college campus. You have structures and official groups. You try to build an environment where people can do their best work. And people will naturally, hopefully, people will naturally make new social groups and connections. As companies grow, teams often develop their own microcultures. We certainly have in the design team at GitHub. Company culture, in my opinion, is as critical to the success of your company as intellectual property or landing on a product that has market fit at the right time. Focusing on building a healthy culture doesn't mean ignoring revenue-generating priorities. It doesn't mean choosing people over the needs of the business. It means recognizing that one impacts the other. And for you, or for us, it might mean embracing a bit of overlap with disciplines in our culture. It might mean leaning into automating all the things, or hiring and building a diverse team so that you have a better representation of the customers you're designing for. 
For me, it also meant creating opportunities to connect, to share and learn from each other, and to celebrate work. Last week, we hosted an internal design conference, conference for the org called Looks Good to Me. I am wearing the jacket for this right now. Uh, sold out already. <laughs> There's still some more swag in the shop, though. Um, we weren't able to do an in-person meetup like we had in previous years, and I wanted to create something that felt a little bit more exciting than virtual conference or virtual offsite. So we did an internal design conference. This was inspired by some of the awesome and fantastic talks that I've seen our team do in our regular monthly design all hands. We decided to put on the internal conference and try and bring some of the energy that you get from events like this. And since it was a conference, it of course needed a name and branding, and so we came up with Looks Good To Me, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a common uh, comment when approving pull requests, often accompanied with a thumbs up. Um, and thus, very GitHub-y, but also something that felt like it could be applied to design in both fun, creative, and also serious ways. It took a bit of effort, but I believe that it more than paid off. This is everyone doing a thumbs up drawing here um, in a warm up activity. <laughs> um, the team were incredibly engaged. Uh, we had a mix of internal and external speakers. Uh, and I, I really feel that some of them were like really high level conference quality. And we had engaging mixer activities like this one on screen and insightful panels with customers and experts in the field. Not only was this great for building energy, we were able to share a lot of the content externally too, so keep an eye out on our GitHub design Twitter. I love this because part of the point of doing it like this was to also give back and share with the community. So I think my early experience getting so much value from the tech community makes me want to create this within our team as well. While I was working on this talk, and reflecting back on my career and path and time at GitHub, I realized that building communities and giving back by sharing lessons learned has been core to me throughout. So perhaps it's not surprising that I found a home at GitHub, which is, after all, the home to the largest open source community in the world. I hope you enjoyed my talk, folks. Thank you for having me. Have fun at Config.